Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of heavy metal origins, looking at another track that paved the way for what metal would become. Today, we're going to be looking at the track Child in Time from the group Deep Purple. Uh, what's interesting about this one is it's a live recording, and it is almost 10 minutes long. So let's dive into this and see what Deep Purple are bringing to the table. Got some funky ideas. What is up with the drum kit though? Ooh, some spiciness. A strange drum kit, really interesting setup. Says a lot about the drummer. Very choice falsetto there. Really fun stuff going on in the drums. Everybody else is vamping. But we got this really nice movement back there. Yeah, really nice rhythmic layering there. Building that stuff out. Oh, I wanna hear you say ah, ah, ah. Oh. oh, wow. A uh, tempo shift. Yeah, either there's a slight retard under there, or we just started rushing a little bit. Uh, it, it's not really clear. Interesting.
one kid is still blowing my mind. Got that walking base. Interesting note choices there. Half step rises. <laughs> okay. With a clean trill. Sweet child in time, you'll see the line, the line that's drawn between the good and the bad. See the blind man, yeah, he is shooting at the world, bullets flying. If you feel bad, Lord, I bet you have, and you've not been here. Still got a lot of the bluesy elements in our vocals, though, which is really interesting uh, lineage here. You better close your eyes. You'd better bow your head. Wait for. That rhythmic layering is even so much better on the second time around. Let's bring it home. The gradual element of this chorus works so well. Half step tension rises.
Okay. Okay. Still processing. Um, so uh, let's see what's going on here. We have um really interesting structure in that we have uh basically A B A C where we have our vocal section, our extended solo section, uh we return to our vocal section and then we finish off with an outro that is a little different than everything else. Um I think what I want to start off here, though, um, so, like, okay, so this came out sometime later than, uh, the last two tracks, the last two tracks we've checked out, um, bam, bam, okay, uh, <laughs> This came out sometime later than the last two tracks we checked out, which were both 69, if I remember correctly. Um, King Crimson, I'm pretty sure, is 69. Sab Black Sabbaths, I think that was late 60s as well. Um, and it's interesting that, like I said, we can kind of hear some elements here. We have the down-tempo uh, verse and chorus, especially the verse that's very reminiscent of... Uh, Black Sabbath, and I had a lot of comments explaining to me, you know, that was one of the big things that made heavy metal heavy was that they weren't afraid of running the tempo down a bit. Uh, uh, where hard rock and some other branches of metal were taking things in a faster direction, Black Sabbath slowed things down and made the path for uh, stoner metal and doom metal, which I was correct in calling. Uh, I said it felt like Proto-Doom, and a lot of people uh, sort of confirmed that. Black Sabbath did start uh, the inspiration for what would become Doom Metal. Um, so here, though, again, we hear a, a down-tempo verse. It's a bit chiller. Uh, the chorus picks it up a little bit, and our solo section speeds it up uh, quite a bit more. We get another 20 or so BPMs out of that. Maybe even more so, as I feel like they do rush it a little bit. I I think that the bridge ended faster than it started. Uh, so there is, like I said, a gradual speed up. I don't know if it's intentional, but in this performance, uh, I'm pretty sure there was one. But regardless, the verse and chorus, or A section, they are slower. Uh, they're a bit on the, the lower end of the BPM. And so this idea of uh, having a slow section, our solo section being faster, uh, extended uh, suspended notes, just having notes hang in the air, uh, which is something we hear during the verse often, um, shredding, uh, utilizing blues elements and some, well, the funk, not so, I think the funk's going to be very relegated to this, but the bluesy aspects, um, you know, all of this is similar things to what we spoke about on Monday with Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. Um, so there's definitely elements in here that I say, okay, this is, this is heavy metal. But to me, it has a lot of that hard rock element in it as well. There is a much stronger bluesy element to it. There's a funk component to it in um, both some of the bass lines that are utilized, the tone of our keyboard or uh, organ, whatever that is, and the vocal inflections, the way that the uh, vocal aspects are delivered. Um, to me, there's some funk aspects in there as well. And some of that kind of brings it down from the weight that I think heavy metal needs to be called heavy metal. It's one of the things I'm slowly figuring out as the difference between heavy metal and hard rock uh, around this era. Um, to me, is going to be the weight of the track. And I don't think that this always carries it. So I'm not sure if this is 
heavy metal or hard rock, but I'm also coming at it 50 years displaced almost. Uh, no, actually 52. Yep. 52 years displaced from the release. So it might just be, like I spoke about yesterday, my modern ears not really feeling that this is heavy because comparatively it's not. But if we go back to 1970, was this heavy? Was this heavier than hard rock? Maybe, maybe by a lot. You know, maybe this is very clearly heavy metal to people who listen to it. Uh, you know, when it was released in, in the time. Uh, this might have been some exceptionally heavy music. I can only listen to it retrospectively. I have listened to a lot of music that has been heavier than it, so my my barometer for heaviness is going to be skewed. Um, I, I just lack that perspective. So, you know, let me know in the comments if this is hard rock or if this is heavy metal. I, like I said, I can hear some heavy metal elements to it, but it also feels just a hair too bluesy. Uh, to be what I think is heavy metal. Anyways, with that said, let's dive into this. Um, like I said, we, we primarily have a, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus thing going on. And I enjoyed what was going on here. I think they have a really nice idea of building this A section. Our verse is a bit slower in tempo, like I mentioned. Our bass primarily plays a few notes here and there. Our guitar is playing a few notes. Our uh, organ player is mostly playing chords, and our drummer is playing exceptionally sparse uh, drum aspect. A lot of cymbal work, not a lot of tom, bass, snare ideas. Uh, we're going to have to talk about that drum kit. <laughs> Not now, we're on the topic of music, but I cannot forget to return to that. That was just wild. Um, anyways, it's a very sparse section. It's slower, it feels emptier, especially compared to our chorus, the latter half of our chorus. Uh, I mentioned that there's an element of uh, growth there, we'll touch on that later, and the bridge. This chorus is very sparse, it almost feels um, isolating. Uh, comparatively so. There is something coming from all the instruments. It's not like there's a lot of empty space in our sound sphere, but it is a very small section compared to everything else that shows up in the track when we look at uh, width and depth of those sections. Um, there's just less happening here. And when we look at our vocals, they're also the most constrained. They are a very comfortable chest level uh, as far as pitch and volume go, it feels more like a very colloquial kind of singing. It's very comfortable. Um, and it's also very quiet. Not volume-wise, it has plenty of power, but you can just tell that the microphone is held a little closer to the lips. And the volume on our engineering is probably boosted a little bit because our vocalist isn't really speaking that loud or singing that loud. And so we get the volume from elements outside of the performance. The performance itself is quieter. Um, and we can feel that. There's a big difference, even though these two volume levels are going to be the same. This feels different than this. This is a very different sound than this. Here I'm projecting. There's power and emphasis behind it. There's uh, proper amounts of airflow to push the the energy forward here this is a bit more restrained i still have the same volume per se but i don't have as much airflow or projection to this um, and through that we actually get two very different sides of our vocalist here one with i don't want to use the word confidence because i don't think it accurately portrays the emotion that's being shown here but that is the resulting feeling is that the verse feels less confident, and maybe that's because it is a more vulnerable style. Whereas our chorus, with that belting, wailing, I don't want to say is more confident, but comes off as more powerful. Maybe it's more raw, maybe it's more true. I don't know. 
I, I don't have the lyrics yet. I don't know what kind of themes we're exploring at the moment, but I really enjoy the contrast between the two vocal styles and kind of the story they're telling about a soft-spoken person who might be hurting inside, and we get to hear both sides of this person. Their, their uh, vulnerable exterior that they, you know, don't know how to speak up or assert themselves and the pain that they feel within which is screaming i really love that duality in our vocal work um and it's not just the vocals it's also the music as well like i mentioned this is a very sparse isolating section it's not that there isn't anything going on but comparatively so there's very limited music happening this section is not loud, it's not bombastic, it's not wide or deep or complex. It is just. It's quiet, it's sparse, there's few notes, it's kind of empty, but it's there. You can't ignore it, but it's really not doing a lot to call attention to itself. Much like this duality, this quiet side of the duality that I'm getting out of the story that the vocals are telling me. Um, and it just, it, it works so well at delivering this, this narrative. We take this into the chorus, which I thought was fantastic. I don't remember if it happened the second and third time around, but the first time around we had this beautiful drum fill that went from our verse to our chorus, where we started out with an eighth note roll, which seemed like one stroke per hit, one hit per stroke. I actually don't know the drumming terminology on that. Um, uh, anyways... One hand movement is one hit. Da, 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 da. We move from that into a proper roll where we get multiple hits out of each downstroke. So we're utilizing the rebound of the of the the drumstick to get extra hits out of each physical arm movement. Um, so it was just this except I wish I could have seen it because the camera didn't look over to the drums and didn't even look at them they were in the background they were half covered by the guitarist at the moment i think or the vocalist um but yeah it didn't even do that until halfway into the second part of the the drum fill but it was just an exceptionally clean precise drum roll we started off with one style eighth notes one hit per stroke and we moved to i think it was two hits per stroke with a triplet feel in the in the in the strokes, if I remember, I just remember it was, it was so clean. It put a smile on my face to hear, and I, I got to go back and check that out again. Like I said, I don't remember if it happened on the second, third times we went into the chorus, but I mean, right, it stuck with me 10 minutes later, and I'm remembering something that happened only on the first time we entered the section, I think. Ah, uh, just such a good, uh, a good, and it's not even like it's super complex, right? It is literally a snare roll. Two different speeds, one speed for four beats, one speed, the other speed for the next four beats. But it's just the execution, how it's placed, um, the precision of it. It is a very clean roll. And reduction of expectations. This section has been very minimal this entire time. And to go from that into eighth notes into sixteenth note roll is a huge shift in style it's it, it comes off as completely unexpected but is a perfect way of bringing us into what the next section is getting ready to deliver which is intensity we have a vocalist who is now wailing utilizing this nice mixed uh head and chest voice um and just absolutely putting a ton of air pressure behind this and having these powerful belts. But they're not accompanied by sounds. It's not, or it's, they're not accompanied by syllables and words. It's literally just screams. And, and we'll dive into this later when we touch on the lyrics and, and see what this song's about lyrically and see if we can tie that back to what the music's doing. But all I hear is pain. I really do. Um, and I'm seeing right here one of my recommended videos is uh, Elizabeth from, uh, what is that, uh, Charismatic Voice, uh, who also did an analysis of this. And I'll probably go check that out when I'm done. 
Um, I am no vocal coach. <laughs> I'm telling you what I heard. The limited amount of information I know about vocal technique, which is primarily air pressure and momentum and consistency because those are the same techniques that are utilized to play aerophones. I'm a trumpet player. <laughs> I, I know about singing techniques that are similar to playing a trumpet, but um, if you're interested in maybe some more technical things, I guess I'm just going to plug the charismatic voice as if they need me to plug it. The video has 1 million views, but a <laughs> uh, fantastic channel for, uh, for vocalist breakdowns. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so, oh yeah, yeah, we got the dude just screaming over here. The drums have really picked up intensity. They are all over the place. We have uh, constant, consistent drumming from toms, snares, uh, the bass kick, cymbals. The hi-hat is constantly going on every hit now. It is just a wild display of sound being created. Because uh, there is a rhythmic component to it. They are sort of do, filling in that, that pocket, the metronome roll of keeping time for the rest of the band, but they're also moving a lot. There's fills every other bar or something like that. Uh, and it really adds to the momentum and direction of this track, consistently pushing it forward. It doesn't feel like it wants to stand still at all, which is very different from our previous section, which felt like it had no problem just existing, just lingering. And this section actively wants to get out of itself. It wants to move to the next step, whether that's returning back to the isolated vulnerability of our verse or moving into our chaotic elements of our solo. It just does not want to be here at all. And I think that makes sense if our vocalist is in pain, if the theme here is... Uh, you know, somebody who is uh, experiencing emotional turmoil. Nobody wants to feel that way. The song is actively driving to fix this, to correct it, to return to something that is different, even if that different is still not great. I'm not going to say the verse feels like relief, but it doesn't feel like this pain and the song wants to get out of it. And a lot of that comes from the drums, just constant intensity. Um, the organ jumps around between a lot of ideas here. I couldn't quite get a read on a pattern for it. Occasionally we'll have solid chords. Other times we'll have some moving ideas and there are a lot of piano slides just starting on one note and do just sliding down the keys and getting a nice um, uh, falling chord basically uh, step by step uh, and kind of mixing all three of these up like I said I couldn't really find a pattern to when they would do what but it was really interesting just to hear all of it and sometimes they were combined uh, you know piano's got two hands it can do two things um, so sometimes we would have a chord and a moving part sometimes the slide would be used as a one bar transition to loop back to the beginning of a pattern that they might have had um, just a, a short little you know one octave fall um, or rise there were a couple of times when I saw them start at the very bottom note and come up an octave octave and a half before going back into the idea um, just really filling in the space with whatever feels they, they feel the section needs at that moment is kind of the role that I'm getting from them. The bass walked a lot of this and uh, a walking bass line is just playing the notes from the chord, not in order. There's a little bit of jumping to it. I suppose you could play them linearly rising and falling. That doesn't really feel like a walking bass line to me, but I mean, technically it is. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea is just to both emphasize the tempo, you mostly play on downbeats, and to emphasize the chord, which is why you're moving between all these different notes. Um, uh, as you play the notes, if the chord shifts every eight beats, well, that gives you eight notes to play, which pretty much gives you an accurate depiction of what the chord is based on what notes the bass is playing. That is their job in a lot of jazz. Uh, it's definitely their job in blues, uh, which means that it's their job in a lot of hard rock and heavy metal that came out in the early days before the bass kind of got relegated to pedal notes um, and root tones, which is where the bass is at 
these days, which is just so sad to move from being a strong component of both the chord structure and the rhythmic aspect of the song to just kind of give in the scraps. Uh, and, you know, as we know, uh, you know, metal in the 90s and early 2000s kind of got rid of the bass. One of the most prominent examples are some of Metallica's works from uh, the 80s and 90s where the bass just kind of isn't present on the album at all. And that's Metallica. And so many people took that as a template. So, uh, yeah, the bass just is having a nice resurgence now. But it's really interesting to hear all of these early tracks. You know, we did Hard Rock Week months ago and we're doing heavy metal origins here and it's so awesome to hear all of this emphasis on the bass both production wise having it present in the mix and also compositional granted it's taking these ideas from its inspirations which is blues but it's still here and it's just to me a little sad for the bass to lose representation over time and now finally getting some of it back although they are still kind of relegated to pedal tones and uh, uh pedal notes and root tones so at least they're getting some of the production side back i guess anyways that's a little a uh, little rant by me let's keep going uh the bass is walking which is really nice is that everything yeah, and the guitar is doing chords, and I could I can't remember what the guitar was doing in the chorus. I don't think it was a melody. I think it was mostly chords, but you know, as I've already noted, there are some minor differences between each of the times they've done these sections, and it's possible that uh, any of the three times we went into the chorus, the guitar had a different role. But what I'm kind of remembering most is chords. Uh, we bounce back and forth on this verse chorus idea once. First chorus, first chorus. However, the second chorus leads us into the bridge. And there is a small tempo shift here because there was, I think leading up into the first bar of the bridge, we had a drum something. I don't know if it was just a pattern that was introducing the new tempo. It could have been like um, moving into that first verse where we had a drum, or sorry, verse, first chorus where we had a drum roll that took us into the new feeling. I don't quite remember, but the drums were in charge of setting this new tempo. And I feel like, oh, you know what? It was like, it was like four bars of setting this new tempo before everybody came in with their roles for the bridge. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. And this tempo, I think, was supposed to be a step up. Just the chorus is at this tempo, the bridge is at this tempo. But what ended up feeling was that we had our step up. And then a small ramp up. Not a lot. But it did kind of feel like it was getting faster and faster and faster. Very slightly. I think we gained maybe 5 BPM over this 4 bar phrase. So not a lot. Which makes me think that it was more... Uh, it was unintentional. The drummer just started rushing here and, and played a bit faster than they should have. Uh, not a dig at them. Uh... Whenever you play a live performance, there's always a chance of that. There are very, very few humans out there with perfect tempo where they can just lock it in and stick with it. There's always going to be minor fluctuations in any live performance. Most of them you're not going to feel. And even here, I doubt many people would have felt it at all. It's 5 BPMs over, uh, you know, 4 or 8 bars or something like that. Most people aren't going to feel it. Um... And even I'm not 100% sure while we were doing the reaction, I said, I feel like it's getting faster. I feel like there's a rushing element here. Um, but I do still think that by the end of the bridge, we were playing faster than the beginning. And I don't think that was intentional either. However, it could have been. I don't know. I, I'm the, I don't have the sheet music in front of me. If there even is sheet music, which I don't think there is. I'm not saying that Deep Purple didn't notate their music, but heavy metal just in general 50 years of heavy metal uh, metal is just not a genre i think of that has music notation tabulature maybe were they using tabs at this time i don't know actually i don't know the history of tabs to me tabs is a digital product but it's not entirely digital you can notate tabs on sheet music in fact when you look at digital 
uh, tabulature software, it is on sheet music, and you can print it out, and it looks no different than sheet music. But to me, it's always been associated with the digital age. I don't know if people actually notated in tab by hand prior to uh, computers. Yeah, if anybody's got insight on that, let me know. Like I said, it's not it's not impossible at all. It's not digital only, but it, to me, tabulature and electronic, uh, you know, and digital uh, notation go hand in hand. I've never, ever, ever seen tabulature outside of that context other than the modern day when bands have sold tab, uh, tabulature books. Um, it's just not something I remember from my youth. Not that I have very much youth pre-digital anyways. <laughs> so again, just another thing I don't have perspective on. Uh, anyways, um, so yeah, this bridge. Let's, let's get back in. <laughs> uh, the bridge in it is an extended solo section, and there's three solos kind of happening. Our bass walks bass line this entire time. I don't remember hearing anything non-walking that they did. Any moment of uh, different melodic playing or different rhythmic playing. Um, the drums, though, were all over the place. They were crazy. They were constantly doing all these wild fills. There is a strong melodic component to their playing. They did have a primarily rhythmic component to their performance where they were the metronome. They kept the tempo for everybody, but it's not the only thing they did. They often embellished it, did some ornamental ideas, tossed in fills every few bars. It was a wildly energetic uh, section for the drums and I absolutely loved checking into them every once in a while and just hearing what kind of phenomenal things was going on there. Um, our keyboard was mostly vamping about some minor uh, melodic ideas, mostly chordal things, but chordal, chordal ideas done rhythmically. Uh, in a few of those shots you could see that they're playing a chord and just bump, bump, bump. Bump, 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 really laying down the chord, maybe moving with the chord progression, bump, 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 bump. but being a rhythmic component. They're not just holding the chord out. There's a rhythm to their uh, their chordal ideas. Um, and then there's a the guitar, and they get the spotlight for the first 70% of this bridge where we see them just tear it up and I, I'm trying not to be too harsh on the salt it's not my kind of guitar solo there are certainly moments in it that I think have really beautiful flow and melodic components to them and then there's other moments that feel very jam band very 70s um, just taking a single idea and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and Again, this is something that maybe at the time was very cool, very new, very innovative. Uh, to me, it's just, it's, I need forward momentum and movement through my solos. And I will say that I appreciate the balance here. Like I said, there were a few moments where it went into more of a linear melodic drive and just moving between ideas rather than sitting on a single rhythmic concept and playing around with it. Um, and in that way, it kind of does feel more like half of a more modern rock solo or metal solo and more of a jazzier solo, which is really interesting because, you know, I'm a jazz guy. I don't really have a problem with repetition in jazz, but I have a very different mindset when I listen to jazz than when I listen to metal. And I really don't know why that is. Repetition does not really affect me in jazz, but I, I wonder how much of it is performance expression. I don't want to get into a big thing here, but I've talked about in the past how playing a playing a an air-based instrument, especially an acoustic instrument. I think that's air and acoustic is very different than playing an electric instrument. You have a lot more control over nuanced dynamics. Uh, and guitars can kind of do this if you have a bunch of pedals and and switches and whatnot and you can modulate stuff on the fly but there's something about listening to a trumpet player choose not just the notes but how to play the notes when to play 
and how to craft their story. That really works for me in a way that when we hit repetitive elements in rock, just don't because the nuanced dynamic quality isn't there. When he takes a five note idea and plays it over and over and over, each iteration is for the most part identical to the last. Um, and I think that might be why I am less forgiving of repetition in guitar solos, electric guitar solos, anyways, especially overdriven electric guitar solos. Um, I don't know. Again, it's the cool thing about this channel is that I get to further explore my biases as well, figure out what I like and why I don't. And as I speak about them, I get to learn more about myself. Sometimes these aren't things that I've given words before, but as I speak about specific things in the music, I'm developing thoughts and opinions about them that are helping me understand my relationship to specific composition techniques. Anyways, though, uh, really great solo, though. You know, half of it bounced off of me, but the other half didn't. Um, and to me, that just shows a, uh, what is it, a mixed, like a mixed, uh, I don't even know where I'm going with this. A mixed appreciation for different styles of art. Like I said, I get a little bit of a jazziness element to this, but a little bit of what would become future rock, which is uh, sort of more of the shredding and, and melody-based writing here. Um, and I think it shows really nice characteristic of this guitarist as somebody who is interested not just in one style of writing melodies, but multiple. In fact, we also hear another component to the solo, which I felt was a bit questionable which was the use of multiple ideas outside of our key. There were a couple of times that uh, notes were selected that were just way dissonant compared to everything else. And it's not like this is a solo that thrived on dissonance. Uh, it was one or two notes that really felt out of place. I don't know if that, I don't know if they were actually in, uh, incorrect notes being played because this is just a really good performer. I've mentioned before that eventually you're going to mess up notes in a performance. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, a world-class player in a, in a symphony or a garage player at the local YMCA putting on a concert or whatever. Um, you're going to have a performance that is not perfect. You're going to miss notes. Um, and the best thing you can do is pretend nothing happened. You miss the note, you flub it, you keep going, and you can just tell people it was intentional, especially in rock or jazz, where it's easier to just say, yeah, <laughs> I put that in there on purpose. I wanted some spiciness to there. Um, but yeah, just there's no inflection in the guitarist's face or hands or body, uh, body language at all that told me they were wrong notes, but they did feel very out of place with the rest of the composition, which didn't rely heavily on dissonance or uh, pulling notes outside the key at all. So I'm curious about those. I'm going to assume they were purposeful, in which case they're very choice notes. Uh, very interesting choices regardless. There was this one idea where we took a simple, like a, a four note run, um, and we started at the base of the ne neck and did ha half steps up, basically putting a chromatic run with a repeating rhythmic structure into the solo. Very interesting because chromatic by definition is every note and well, other than the chromatic key, there is no key that contains every note. So this section contains a lot of notes outside of the key. This is the only other moment where dissonance against what the band is playing was strongly showcased. Other than the outro, and we'll get to that. But it came after the initial two hits, uh, the initial two notes that were very odd to me, very dissonant. These were the only two moments where dissonance was uh, a really strong factor. This one, though, had a foundation to it as it was a chromatic rise. Um, so, like I said, I'm still not sure about the earlier two notes. They could have been wrong notes. They could have just been super spicy ones. Uh, but this chromatic rise is interesting because it showcased, like I said, this third aspect. We have the jazzy element. We have the uh, stronger, or sorry, the jazzy repetition the stronger melodic soloing, and then this experimental type of soloing that says, what if we just play every note? 
this I think was really neat and I you know I'm kind of wondering if this might have led to more bands trying stuff like this these types of uh, chromatic concepts we see a lot more in prog bands that were going that will show up three to six seven years uh, after this track after yeah this was 1970 I don't know when the album came out this live performance is from 1970 though um but yeah the chromatic concepts are something we would see in a lot of prog rock bands that would come up later um so it's interesting to hear that influence or what would become an influence for other bands uh and i think that's the whole oh no 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 that's not the whole bridge because there is this really clean moment when everybody stops playing the drummer holds all their symbols or the two symbols they have they only have two hands and the piano begins to introduce the beginning of the verse again. But we don't actually go into the verse. The drums do pick up their verse line. The guitar picks up their verse line. We return to a very um, isolating, sparse drum idea. But our organist gets to solo. And I thought this was a really nice solo. There wasn't anything uh, particularly interesting in it, I'd say. There were some really nice uh, double grace notes hits. If it was a, a woodwind instrument, I'd call it a trill. I don't know if that terminology works for uh, keys. But, yeah, just like two or three notes coming in right before the note you really want to hit. So a grace note is a really quick note before your note. So if you have a note on a downbeat, bum, 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 your grace note would be da-dun, da-dun. Dun, it's that note that comes right before the beat. So when I say this double grace note or triple grace note, it's two or three really quick notes before the note you're really landing on, the one that you really want to emphasize. Um, and like I said, if this were a woodwind instrument, flute, trumpet, uh, not, not woodwind in particular, an aerophone, uh, woodwind, trumpet, whatever, we'd call these trills, just really fast notes played back to back. Um, but really beautiful uh, elegance to it that we haven't really seen anywhere else in the track. They really stood out. Um, other than that, just a lot of really strong melodic writing here. I really enjoyed that. Uh, it was a nice counterpoint to some of the more repetitive elements that we saw in the guitar. This was also a beautiful transition because while we're still in the bridge, we're still in the solo section, we've already introduced the next section's foundational elements we are going to return back to the verse we already brought the verses elements into our bass guitar and drums so when we are done with the solo and bring the vocals back in to finish the song out we're already there it is a really nice transition that one works because usually when a quieter instrument solos you are going to quiet the band down this is something that jazz does a lot um And so in that respect, it works really well here. The The organ's going to solo. We bring the band down. That that makes sense. But to reuse an older idea, especially one that we're going into next, so we're not actually going to have to change any of the foundational things when we move to the next section, is genius. That is the kind of smart copying pasting that I've talked about so much on this channel for you know inspiring composers. When you're writing new stuff, you don't always need to write new stuff you can sometimes reuse what you've already done and in some ways it's going to make your song feel more cohesive because of it and this is one of those moments they could have written an entirely new section that would have been quieter to sit underneath this organ solo but they didn't they reuse something that helps tie it to where we're going and allows the transition to be entirely seamless beautiful stuff right there um we go back to the verse, we go back to the chorus, and then we have our outro, which is just noise and chaos. I think our vocalist is wailing louder than ever, higher than ever, I think, even pitch-wise. Uh, drums are just all over the place. Uh, guitars just playing whatever they want. The, get, the guitar is doing, uh, sorry, the bass is doing whatever they want. The guitar is doing whatever they want, too, but they're also implementing a lot of slides to get microtonality across, and our organ is just doing all sorts of stuff it is just a noisy section it sounds like the song is breaking down um interestingly this is not the first time we've heard that this week yesterday's king crimson track also had this as an outro um i wonder how often it's going to pop up 
I mean, by by now, 2022 standards, um, it's not overplayed, but I do think it's a trope. The song breaks down at the end. I'm sure there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of songs that have done it by now. I don't know how popular it was or how often it was done by this point in time, but, um, you know, this is we're three songs into this week's theme, and 66% of the songs have had this element in it. Uh, and one of the other times that we've, well, no, no, we're not going to bring that up. Uh, not relevant. So yeah, again, I don't know that there's anything I need to say in particular about it. It's just the emotional value of that section is a deconstruction of what's happening. And that's pretty much the whole song. Um, we've gone through the emotional elements uh, the roles of all the instruments, the structure of the track as a whole, and how everything fits together with smooth transitions. The last thing I need to talk about before we get into the lyrics is the drum kit. At first I thought maybe the video was reversed somehow. And then I saw everybody else was holding their, the, the guitarists and the bassists were holding theirs normally, left hand on the neck. I say normally, I, they're right handed. Uh, the keyboard, when we went down in pitch, went to the left, so okay. Everything else is uh, typical, more standard. Our drums are backwards, though. Our hi-hat is on the right. And aside from that, our two main symbols, the ride and the crash, I think, are above our drummer's heads. Are above our drummer's head. He only has one. Um, and uh, The snare is semi-centered, but there's toms both left and right on it. It is a very perplexing drum kit setup. And there's always something about unusual, or I should say non-standard drum kit setups that are going to bring my attention to them. Because it makes me wonder what their intentions are. The thing about the standard drum kit setup with the snare mostly in front of you, a little to the left, your toms going up and around, uh, your hi-hat on the left, and uh, your other cymbals kind of being positioned between or above your toms is mostly about lowest common denominator accessibility. It's about what foot's what feet, what foot is supposed to do what, which foot is often dominant, which dominant foot, uh, you know, which foot needs to do the most things, as well as keeping all of the things close to you and ensuring that the ways that you need to interact with different simultaneous drums can be done easily based on traditionally right-handed dominant people. Um, and I would, I, I'm going to say that this is probably a left-handed drummer. Primarily because the entire kit is mirrored. But there's other ideas, like the raised symbols, that make me question what the intent is behind them. Because the reason that people deviate from uh, traditional setups is because they have a different type of accessibility. Maybe they're playing music that works better if you change how to get to things. If you change the distance between... Uh, an instrument and you or a different placement of them you know if you're if you're constantly hitting two different symbols you don't want them to be on opposite sides because then you're constantly going back and forth that's a lot of energy you put them next to each other and it's less movement especially if it's something you're going to do in a lot of your songs uh, again it's about accessibility being able to access all of the parts of the kit what advantage does the drummer get by having to raise his hands up so high to get the cymbals? I don't know. Is there a sonic thing going on there where they can be heard wider? Or maybe they reverberate different or, or something. I, I don't know because the accessibility thing I don't think helps at all. I don't think that the, it's faster at all or, or easier to hit with them way up there. And it makes getting back down to the toms more difficult. Uh, so I have a lot of questions about that, but it also kind of makes me think that either our drummer is a genius for sonic quality and that there's something happening here that really works for an acoustic, I think, non-miked situation. Of course, when you have mics directed, you know, you have a different shotgun mic on each of your 
on each of your instruments in your drum kit, you don't really need to care too much about reverberance to affect the acoustics of a room. So like I said, maybe there's some really genius things going on here to help the live performance here. But if not, it just tells me that this drummer is very quirky. And, uh, which is a very cool quality. But it makes me want to ask them what's going on with their drum kit if they're still alive. Um, or maybe if there's been an interview, what was with the raised symbols? It's just, it completely throws me off. The mirroring thing, I, like I said, I think it's because they're left-handed. Um, I think the snare was a bit off to one side, more so than usual. Could just be, you know, a personal personal thing. Maybe it just feels more natural to reach over to hit it rather than centered. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, the symbols just make no sense to me, though. Completely blowed, blew my mind when I saw that. It just seems so uh, unwieldy. But pulled it off with some really fast uh, things in there too although I did notice primarily a lot of snare and drum work and snare and tom work the cymbals were used a bit sparser and maybe that was the thing get them out of the way because I don't need them that much I don't know the reason for it uh very interesting let's dive into some lyrics here and see what's going on I do have a question about the length though because the guitar solo started out feeling tied to the song and the second half of the guitar solo felt more of an extended version that drifted a bit from what the verse and chorus were doing. And I wonder if this is traditionally a 10 minute song or if maybe this is an elongated live version uh, with an extended uh, solo section in it because it was live. Um... Should I? I'm just going to use the original. There's also a live set of lyrics, but they're for a 1972 performance. And I don't know if that's accurate. All right. So I'm just going to use the, uh, the studio lyrics set. It's going to be close enough, I think. Um, so let's dive into this. We have sweet child in time. You'll see the line, the line that's drawn between good and bad. See the blind man shooting at the world. Bullets fly taking toll. If you've been bad, oh Lord, I bet you have, and you've not been hit by flying lead. You'd better close your eyes, bow your head. Wait for the ricochet. Oh, I forgot about that. Wait for the ricochet was a section I, I mentioned twice because the guitar, the drums, and the lyrics all had the same rhythmic idea there. And it just, it really solidifies that section and makes it punch harder. Um, it makes that sentence have a lot more weight. And uh, yeah, just such a good moment. Like I said, it was even better the second time around knowing it was coming. Mm, so good. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, somebody who's blind, blindly putting bullets into the world. And it says, if you've been bad and you've not been hit, you better bow your head and wait for the ricochet. Basically saying that, uh, the people who are bad, the bullets are most likely coming for you soon. Right. Maybe even, I don't know, maybe even not bad. Or maybe not soon, but the bullets are magnetized, drawn towards bad people. It's interesting that this is the second time it's come up because morality has. Anyways, the second line of the song is that the line that's drawn between good and bad. There is a line there. We have a blind man shooting at the world with bullets flying. And if you've been bad, you better close your eyes and bow your head because that bullet's coming for you. Okay. So it is a blind, it, there is blindly sh shots, blind shots happening, but they are gravitating towards the bad people, which seems odd. Uh, the bridge is just the screaming and wailing. He says, ah, I want to hear you singing within all of that. I don't remember that line coming up, but maybe it did. Um... 
Our verse 2 says, Sweet child, in time you'll see the line, the line that's drawn between good and bad, the blind man shooting at the world. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. So that's, the whole song has one line to it. Or one, <laughs> one stanza. And screaming, I have no idea what this is about then. I mean, that's it. <laughs> uh... There's a line between good and bad people and bullets are flying and they're kind of gravitating towards bad people. But maybe that's not the only people they're hitting because it's the bullets are flying and taking a toll. I don't know. I'm kind of a bit lost on this. Um, and because of that, I have absolutely zero things to tie back to the music, which I did find some themes of duality within of uh, pain and suffering and uh, isolation and self-doubt none of which really crops up in the lyrics that I've picked up on so those are my geez this is a one hour video <laughs> those are my thoughts on uh, Deep Purple's Child in Time Live 1970 this is where you guys come in hit me up in the comments I had a few questions if you want to answer those also, just let me know if you enjoyed this or not. Anything that stood out to you, anything I spoke about you'd like to add on to or correct me. Uh, I am not a perfect individual. There's plenty of things that I say that are incorrect, varying amounts of incorrect, maybe slightly incorrect. Maybe I'm just completely uh, peddling wrong information. Let me know so I don't do that in the future. <laughs> Uh, when you're done commenting, you head up to the description box and there's a link for Linktree that takes you to this menu right here. Has everything related to the channel. You can pick up merch, support the channel through Patreon, submit special selections, join the Discord, follow me on Twitter, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. Alright, that wraps up this video. We also have a special selection today. Um, I don't remember anything about it. Don't even remember the band name. Go ahead and check that out. Otherwise, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, more heavy metal and our final special selection for the week. Until next time, remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.